I'm Deborah Waroff. I'm the co-host of MECFS Alert, and I'm following up Llewellyn King's beginning. We're interviewing Mady Hornick, and uh, we're talking about ME and the recent very splendid work on the immune markers. Thank you. And um, now, one thing I'd like to know, bringing this into the real world, it's enormously expensive at present to test people for immune markers. Um, do you have any idea what it would cost to replicate some of this testing in the real world, say if Dr. Levine tried to do it on me, for example? Yeah. Well, we're quite a ways yet from a research, going from a research test to a clinical test that we can, you know, deploy yeah. in the field. But we do know that we have some other data that mm. we think will be very helpful. In the process of validating, you know, these these types of tests, oh, yeah. you know, we, we need to, you know, test it in other populations as well, and we need yeah. to be able to have people who have other disorders to see how specific it is, mm. you know, and to, uh, other disorders that can affect the immune system so that we can learn, you know, make the test as specific as possible as well as as sensitive as possible for this diagnosis. But yeah. we have a longitudinal study that we're starting to do. So we're looking within a subset of the individuals who we studied already in the paper that just came out. Right. And we're looking over the course of a year or more to see how people's immune signatures change over time in correspondence with their clinical status. So do we see changes in their cytokines when their clinical status changes? Are any of these cytokines uh, able to be tested commercially at present? Well, yes, they are, but we don't know how those will perform in, you know, as just a single type of cytokine. As you may recall from looking at our, our research, we looked at 51 different cytokines, and it was putting those all together. It may be that not everyone has an elevation on, on every one of the cytokines that we found to be increased in the people who had the uh, disease for less than, you know, for three years or less. It may be that you have to look at many of them and look at the profile, and we look at how they work together. And so I, I think we may be thinking more along the lines of a panel of cytokines that need to be tested and trying to create something that would be much more cost effective so that we can get this type of test out into the communities where it's so needed. Yeah, well, I don't know about the lab work and the testing, but it does seem that you could once you get through all the research and all the proving that you could do a panel that would be automated to bring down. Is that possible? Could this be automated? I mean, you haven't done anything that has to be done by hand, except well, for now. Right. Well, you, you know, you'd expect it to be a type of test, certainly, that could be deployed in most clinical labs. You yeah. want to be able to have something that can be easily done mm -hmm. in your standard clinical laboratory setting. And so that would bring the cost down, and it, there are definitely ways to do that. So that you know, that that would be the way in which we would see the direction of our, you know, assay development. We would want it to go in that direction. Right, putting the research to use with an ordinary population and ordinary doctors writing the order and so forth. Yeah, exactly. you could do that. Do you have any sense, uh, obviously you wouldn't know about this particular set of uh, variables, but looking at other diseases and other markers that have developed, how long has the time typically been between a research stage that you are at now and actual commercialization? say, for Epstein-Barr, for example, which I guess was in the 60s it started. Well, it's a very, very important question. We certainly have the technologies available to do this now. What we don't have is the type of funding stream and intensive funding that would enable us to accelerate this process. It takes a lot of funding to recruit patients, to characterize them as carefully as they were in our 
chronic fatigue initiative study and our NIH study, mm -hmm. you know, those are the two populations right. that we looked at in this current, you know, uh, st study of cytokines. And so just even recruiting the patients, making sure that you get the samples, acquire the samples in the right conditions and, mm -hmm. you know, and process them and so forth, it, it takes a lot of funding and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, effort to do that. With, you know, with funding, it could be fast-tracked, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we, we would want to be able to do this on the order of, you know, a couple of years, mm -hmm. you know, or less, but ah. we need, but we, we obviously need funding to be able to accomplish that. Well, talking about doing large clinical trials and recruiting large numbers of people and typing them, I think you're up towards a billion, aren't you? It's a lot of fun. A lot of money. You're not going to say. You know, it's hard. But it's hard. To, it's hard to say. But certainly, we know that you know things that are priorities that are uh, you know source you know re have appropriate resources. Things can be made to happen, and we certainly you know hope that we'll be able to uh, be fortunate in you know in having the resources to continue this work. We've and again we have been fortunate with the chronic fatigue initiative from the Hutchins Family Foundation. Yes. That's been really um, they're really prescient in the uh, funding streams that they allow to uh, to really accelerate this sort of research that you know was reflected in our current publication. And we have more data coming out that's mm -hmm. also funded by that, that same group and it really is very important. We hope NIH will step up to the plate too. Yes, I hope so also. Uh, well, talking about the older group, I don't have from the write-up, I don't really have a sense of where the deadening is occurring in the immune system. I mean, we know that lots and lots of people have really low NK cytotoxicity. So that's one. What else is happening to these people who've had this for anywhere else from three to 25 years? So many of the inflammatory cytokines mm -hmm. are at very, very low levels as, as well. And, you know, so most of the differences that we saw in the long duration mm -hmm. subjects who had been ill for so many years, mm -hmm. many of those, you know, were in the inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything that was up in the short duration yeah. subjects was down in the long duration subjects. And that's why we're very keen to see these data that we're looking at now where we're looking we have up to three samples about a year apart in a, you know in a subset of, of, of patients and controls just to see how these immune signatures change over time and I mean we think that that's going to be helpful and you know in our seeing where did where is the turning point because not all of them are short duration, some of them are older, and mm -hmm. is there sort of a continued deceleration, you know, a, a decrease over time, uh, you know, once you get into the later phases of disease, or does it plateau, and where, you know, at what time point within individuals does it really seem to change, and maybe there's some clues there as to how we might be able to prevent that change. That, that would be significant yes. to prevent it getting worse or exactly. whatever. Right. Well, my sense from talking to clinicians is that for a lot of people, uh, as they age out or age in, whatever, there's a sudden kind of cataclysmic or, or you know falling off a cliff in terms of the immune system. Have you seen anything in your data about the more long-life disease that would well, that's what we're exactly hoping to, you know, to see whether we have evidence of that in, you know, in this longitudinal study. I think that's going to be very, very important, and we hope that we'll have an opportunity to do more serial type of testing over time, you know, looking at the short duration group yeah. as they, you know, go out to the later phases of disease. What What's happening? Is there a point where they dramatically drop off? And maybe combine that with studies of looking at the which immune cells are present. How many NK cells do they have? Yeah. And you know, and how active are they? Um, how many B cells of different B cell types? How many T cells of different T cell types do they have? And so that we can understand this process as you know as best we can. We're talking about the cells, but looking at the B cells, for example, 
do you see any relation to the possibility that there may be some little pathogens, very little pathogens, hiding inside the bee cells? Well, that's part of our hypothesis. So we, uh, you know, we're um, starting to, you know, collect the data now, mm -hmm. looking within the white blood cells, which uh, includes bee cells. Yeah and to see whether there are any pathogens that are lurking there. Yeah. And so we're very eager to, to get those data. So the, you know, that work is also in progress. And I think if we were able to find a set of pathogens, I doubt that it's just one pathogen. Yeah. But yeah. if we were to be able to find, to find a set of pathogens, that would give us a really uh, great start on trying yeah. to figure out, you know, the mechanisms of this illness, but also how best to treat it. Is it possible, I know this is extremely speculative, but is it possible that some of them might be endogenous pathogens as opposed to visiting pathogens? It's possible, and yeah. you know, and part of the endogenous pathogens mm -hmm. are not only the things like, you know, you can have everything from chromosomally integrated yeah. HHV6, right. you know, her human herpes virus, you know, and, uh, and, and other endogenous retroviruses and, so, you know, so forth. There are all sorts of, you know, things that are in, you know, mm -hmm. the genome. But we're very interested in the endogenous um, microbes that reside in your gastrointestinal tract as well as in the oropharynx, you know, the, ah. the nasopharynx, and these contribute to your immune uh, status and also contribute to your, you know, your brain functioning by the, you know, the products of these mm -hmm. different bacteria. Right, I've almost forgotten about that part for the moment. <laughs> I'm so excited about the uh, cytokine results. But uh, going back to the microbiome, is there anything new there in terms of funding? Uh, well, we're very excited. We have um, that you know, although we didn't reach our goal, we have uh, had been uh, really. Um, had this great opportunity through a crowdfunding effort yeah. um, and called the Microbe Discovery Project that has um, given gotten us partway to the to the overall goal, right. and we have uh, decided to you know uh, start to look at the uh, oropharynx. We have a small so looking at the yeah. we have swabs from the you know from the you know throat area right. um, that will allow us to look at the pathogens that are in that area and also the, the microbiome that is naturally present there and see if it's disrupted in people with MECFS. So that, you know, we're, we're putting, you know, we're putting the funding towards that effort. Um, we're continuing to do the work on the gut microbiome. Oh. We have funding for a preliminary study there. Oh. We still are, you know, hoping that we will be able to get funding to expand that work so that we will have sufficient numbers. Yes. You know, it's probably MACFS is a heterogene heterogeneous disorder. We want to have reflected in our studies the wide, you know, diversity mm. that is present in the patient population, so that we can really give the most help to all of these subsets of people with MACFS. Well, I think from talking to patients and and reading. Um of experiences that there certainly is something going on in the gastrointestinal area in very, very many cases. So you're definitely on the right track there. Yeah. Now, in the oral... Uh, or pharynx. Or pharynx. pharynx. Are there... Um, is that a great deal cheaper to study than actual fecal matter? Well, we think that there's going to be somewhat... Uh, more constricted, uh, you know, microbiome to uh, look at there, um, and so and we already have those samples in hand, so we don't have to do additional collections, cool. which also reduces the cost because yes. every time you you know, I, I'm sure you know what it takes to get patients in. Some cool. patients you know are homebound, and most of the time many patients are and so it's very difficult to get patients in so there's the cost of the you know not just the recruitment and finding the patients but getting them in and getting them characterized and getting the samples and so forth so with the oral microbiome through the chronic fatigue initiative we already have those samples in our sample bank so that cuts some of the cost right away um, for, for that analysis.
well, with uh, looking forward to Fantasyland, if or not Fantasyland, but you know what one would like to do with uh, other collections other than the oral pharynx. Um, would it be possible with the homebound, or are you thinking of sending professionals, nurses, whatever, out to do the collecting for you? That seems to me the only way you can really get severe patients studied. A lot of that will, you know, really depends on funding because yes. our clinician, you know, experts have been extraordinary yeah. in, you know, in doing this, um, you know, on a shoestring yeah. budget. Um, you know, they, it, it takes, you know, you have to have the support so that we maintain the quality of the data collections. Yes. You know, and so that everything is controlled the way a study needs to be, you know, and when you try to, you know, uh, match that with the clinical realities of this very disabled population, yeah. it becomes very expensive. But if we had the appropriate support, that would be that would be a dream to be able to also reach those more severe individuals so that we could, you know, ensure that their, you know, uh, differences in the immune system or microbiome or whatever was, you know, uh, perhaps reflected in our study so that we could perhaps make some inroads there as well. Yeah, I should think you would need at least to be employing RNs who have experience of being very particular about everything. And that they are expensive, right. to, uh, right. fortunately for them. But um, anyway, if you could have anything you want, if you could get anything from the NIH, for example, in the way of funding, how much would you want to complete this area, of both areas of research, both the cytokine and the uh, fecal, how much would it be if, if, if you had an open charge account? Huh. Uncle Sam gave you an open charge account. You know, I think that this is a disorder that affects at least two and a half million Americans. Yeah. Right? We don't even know. The, the, the how far this you know this disorder goes amongst the families of individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. And so you know we would be thinking about possibilities of a program mm. that was able to take people and even include people who had their first episode of Epstein Barr virus with infectious mono and followed them up and to see the five to ten percent that had that developed chronic fatigue syndrome, so we can right. follow it up. You know, that we're talking about a $50 million enterprise at minimum. Well, that's not unreasonable. Jose Montoya the other day was talking about a real necessity uh, among all the researchers for $100 million a year, which would be considerably less than multiple sclerosis, which has 400,000 patients versus possibly two and a half million. So it's much more than we're used to. So people tend to blanch, but it's not unreasonable. Anyway, is there a final word you'd like to offer that you'd like people to know about in terms of your research? Well, I'm really thankful that we've had this opportunity for all of the in, you know, individuals in the MECFS, mm -hmm. you know, community, we're so thankful for all of their support, mm -hmm. and, and you know, crowdfunding. We're thankful to you know our fund, our major funders on this particular project, mm -hmm. Chronic Fatigue Initiative, um, and in order to have the opportunity to call attention to this disorder, which has been so maligned, mm -hmm. so stigmatized finally have an opportunity to begin to focus the attention on the biologic aspects of this disorder so that we can start to make a difference. Well, you've made a fabulous mark in terms of attracting attention and uh, acknowledgement this time. Thank you so much. It was lovely to see you again. Really great to see you. Bye-bye.